Saul is dead. The man who hunted David's life to kill him, who threw a spear at him twice, he has died. Now, if you were David, how would you respond to news of Saul's death? Well, David, he's far better than you or I. In further evidence legitimizing David's uh, claim to the throne, when Saul dies, David tears his clothes. He mourns and weeps and fasteds uh, for the death of Saul and Jonathan. And then he sang this lament, famous words in 2 Samuel 1. He says, Your glory, O Israel, is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. The mighty, they have fallen. The weapons of war have perished. David composes this lament over Saul and Jonathan, and then he teaches it to the people for them to sing too. Clearly, David had no ambition to expedite his rise to the throne, but rather than let his own arm work salvation, thank you, Abigail, David would wait patiently for the Lord to exalt him um, to the throne of Israel. David would even take severe action against those who would harm Saul or his family. In uh, chapter 1 of 2 Samuel, David puts to death the messenger who tells him that Saul is dead. Now, of course, this messenger uh, did the final blow against Saul. Saul is laying there dying, and this guy comes by. He's like, please kill me. And the messenger says, oh, sure, I don't mind. Poke. Let me take your crown. Oh, here, David, check it out. Well, David doesn't approve of that, and so he executes Saul's murderer. And we have this exact same sequence repeated in chapters 3 and 4, but in reverse chiastic order. So in chapter 1, we have an execution and a lament, and now in 3 and 4, we have a lament and an execution. Take a look at this chiasm here. Again, these chiasms are all over the place. Thank you, David Dorsey, for helping us see them. This second lament is over the death of Abner. Abner was Saul's military commander. Um, and uh, <coughs> the execution for the murderers was of Saul's son, Ishbosheth. And their murderers were um, a couple of guys by the name of Rahab and Bana. They snuck into the house of Ishbosheth by night. Actually, it was noonday while he was sleeping in his bed, and they put him to death and beheaded him and took his head all the way to David at Hebron. Now, David says these very revealing things, which again, I think, help to legitimize his claim to the throne. He's not a usurper. Um, look what David says um, to uh, Rechab and Banab. He says, when one came and told me, behold, Saul is dead. This is from chapter one. And he thought that he was bringing me good news. You know what I did to him? I seized him and I killed him at Ziklag. That was the reward I gave him for his news. How much more when wicked men like you two have killed a man more righteous than yourself in his own bed, will I now require um, his blood at your hands? And then he executes these murderers. Well, who is this Isbesheth? Anyways, um, he was murdered by Rechab and Bana. Uh, who is he? Well, David hears of the death of Saul when he's all the way down in Philistine territory of Ziklag. And of course, we remember that Saul died way up in Jezreel. So David is down in Ziklag. Saul dies up here. We have the um, Witch of Endor that he visits here in the north of the Jezreel Valley. And <clears throat> after... Um, David learns of Saul's death. He inquires of the Lord, God, I'm in Philistia right now. Should I go back to Judah? What do you think? And God says, yes, you should go to Hebron. So David does. He obeys the voice of the Lord. He listens. He shamas. He goes to Hebron where he is made king over the south, over Judah. David is appointed king in chapter 2. Meanwhile, Abner, you remember him, he is Saul's military commander, and he makes Saul's son, Ishbosheth, king in the north, or specifically in the region of Gilead, here to the east of the Jordan River. Um, and he makes him king, sets his capital at Machanaim, um, here in the east. What follows after this, in chapter 
3 and 4 is this civil war between those loyal to David and those loyal to Saul, um, a war with Ishbosheth. What really turns the tide in this war is the betrayal of Abner. Abner was working for Ishbosheth, and then Abner turns sides and he goes to David and he says, I will persuade the elders of Israel to make you king over all of Israel. David agrees to this, but then Joab, David's military commander, assassinates Abner. However, even after Abner's assassination, support for Ishbosheth is tanking. No one wants him to be king anymore. And this opens the door for an assassination attempt by Rechab and Bana. And that is how David becomes king over all Israel. Let's look at the moment um, in chapter 5 when David is made king. So all the elders of Israel came to David at Hebron, and they made a covenant with David before the Lord and anointed him king over all Israel. Now, what follows after this is a short summary statement of, G of uh, David's reign as king. He was 30 years old, and he began to reign. He reigned 40 years. This is a summary statement. And after the summary statement, we have a list of David's military accomplishments, as in this case, uh, his defeat of the Philistines. Now, this same sequence of events is going to be repeated um, again on the other side of yet another chiasm. We have a summary um, and then military victories. And then here in chapter 8, we have military victories and a summary. Well, <laughs> here in chapter 8, it appears as if these events are included, of course, um, to make this chiastic arrangement right here. The defeat of the, the Philistines were fully subdued, but this also provides for us yet another opportunity to contrast the reign of Saul with the reign of David. Now, we look at a couple of the similarities in an earlier lecture. There are even more differences. Now, of course, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, but the Lord was with David. Saul inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him. David inquired of the Lord constantly, and the Lord did answer him. And then um, pertinent for 2 Samuel 8, we see in the days of Saul, there was hard fighting against the Philistines all the days of Saul. The hard fighting never stopped. But um, in the days of David, his reign, he defeated the Philistines and subdued them um, so that they were no longer a threat to David. However, David's victories extended far beyond just the Philistines. He is going to be beating his foes left and right, especially in the east. Take a look again at this map, um, which chronicles uh, David's uh, wars and his victories. So we see in chapter 8, he's going to defeat the, the Moabites and the Edomites. Um, he's going to go way up north and defeat uh, Zoba and their allies, the Syrians. And all of this, David's victories and in increasing the, the, the size and the scope of, of the territory in Israel, it is of far more interest than merely history and geography. No, these chapters in particular, chapters 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, they are the high point of the entire book. They describe David at his best. This is when he is an ideal and he is, is a model. He is the model king for all other kings of Judah and for the Messiah himself. Now, chapter 8 specifically, these, these victories where David subdues and then rules over the nations— um, some of these nations, they require a stern hand, but others come willingly, and they come bringing gifts. Take a look at this. This is an important little prophetic motif in, uh, in the prophets and in the historical narratives as well. Um, so if we go all the way down to the account described in 2 Samuel 8, we read that David uh, defeated the Moabites. The Moabites became his servants, and they brought tribute, bringing gold and silver and other merchandise into Israel. He defeated the Syrians. The Syrians become uh, servants to David, and they brought tribute, along with the Edomites. Now, David's relationship with Toi, in particular, T-O-I is how we, we translate his name, king of Hamath, it's very interesting, and it seems to potentially resemble the political relationship that Solomon had with the Queen of Sheba. Both of these foreign dignitaries are going to bring 
gold and other merchandise, willingly acknowledging David as king and later Solomon. Now, this is the hope and the expectation of the prophets, this scene of, of the nations submitting to the king of Israel and bringing their treasures uh, before them. We, we read about this all over the prophets. Look at Isaiah 18, verse 7. At that time, this is a, a prophetic statement looking far into the eschatological future. At that time, tribute will be brought to the Lord of hosts to Mount Zion. Isaiah chapter 60 is phenomenal. Uh, it says, the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. Now, who is this you? Look at um, verse 14. It is the city of Zion. This whole poem, Isaiah 60, is being addressed to the city of the Lord, the, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Your gates, O Zion, shall be open continually. Day and night they shall not be shut, so that the people may bring to you the wealth of their nations, their kings in procession. Think about Toy, king of Hamath. Well, this glorification of Zion is the next prophetic and messianic motif that is highlighted here in this high point section of the whole books of First and Second Samuel, the glorification of Zion. Now, David, he faced a rather difficult task when he became king over all Israel. How is he going to maintain the loyalty of all these 12 tribes? They're always bickering and fighting with one another. Think about the book of Judges. It's a disaster. Well, David decides to locate his capital in Jerusalem, which made a whole lot of sense. Um, on the one hand, it's centrally located with Judah in the south and um, Israel north of the city of Jerusalem. And it was a neutral site at this point in Israel's history, controlled neither by Judah nor by Israel, but rather by the Jebusites. And so David conquers this city, makes it his political capital, but then realizes quite quickly that true unity um, within Israel is not going to come politically only. It must be religious as well. And therefore, he moves the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh or from um, Kiriath Jerim, where it is at this point. It had been for 20 years. And he moves it to uh, Jerusalem. However, this is easier said than done. You can just ask Uzzah. That's what he would say to you. You see, initially, as David is moving the cart, uh, moving the ark on a cart to Jerusalem, he is celebrating with lyre, harp, and tambourine, singing and dancing, um, bringing up this ark from the house of Amminadab, where it is located in Kiriath Jerim. Let's see. Here it is, Kiriath Jerim. That is where it had been for the last 20 years. After the ark um, went through the land of Philistia and defeated it and um, cut off the head of Dagon, the king of the Philistines, um, it had been located in Kiriath Jerim. And David is bringing it up from there with celebration until Uzzah reached out his hand and touched the ark of the covenant because. It had slipped off of the cart that the oxen were pulling. And when this happened, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down, and he died. Now, religious fervor and the best of intentions do not erase disobedience. You see here, we read that the Ark of the Covenant was transported on a cart. But the Torah... The Torah teaches us that um, the, the ark is not to be transported on a cart, but rather it is to be held um, via poles by the sons of Kohath. Let's go to Numbers chapter 4, where we learn about uh, the, the specifications for the ark. Look at verse 4. This is the service of the sons of Kohath and the tent of meeting. They are responsible for transporting the most holy things. These are the things that are inside of the holy place and the most holy place. The Ark of the Covenant, of course, is included among them. Uh, verse 15, when Aaron and his sons, these are the priests, they go inside of the most holy place and they cover um, all of the furnishings um, of the sanctuary. They put cloths on top of them. And then, only after this takes place, then the sons of Kohath can come inside 
um, and carry them. However, they must not touch these holy things lest they die. And they are to be carried. We see um, the sons of Kohath are to carry them. Look at chapter 7. You see there are three different sons of Aaron, the sons of Gershom, um, they were given a couple wagons, four oxen for them to carry all their stuff. Now, the sons of Merari, they got four wagons and eight oxen, but the sons of Kohath, you know, those who are responsible for carrying the most holy things, no, they get no oxen, no carts, because they were charged with the holy things that had to be carried on the shoulder. This is how God has specified that his um, most holy things are to be transported. Now, we have spent a long time and gone into a lot of detail about this little minor story here in 2 Samuel 6 with the death of Uzzah. And we did this intentionally because the text of Samuel is going to put a lot of stress on listening to the words of Yahweh. Saul did not listen. He did not shema to Yahweh's words, and therefore his kingdom was torn from him. And here in chapter 6, David did not listen to the words of Yahweh as recorded in Numbers 4 and Numbers 7. However, David did repent. He repented and he completed the journey of the ark to Zion. And as he's doing so, he's dancing and he's wearing, get this, a linen ephod. You go back to um, 1 Samuel 2 and 3 and we read, Samuel is wearing a linen ephod. That's the last time this expression is used. Combine this little detail with the fact that after the ark completed its journey to Zion, David blessed the people. And if we go back to chapter 21, David is going to eat the bread of the presence given to him by the priest of Nob, Ahimelech. All of this um, presents for us an unmistakable caricature of David as a king priest. He is a king and a priest. He's functioning in a priest in a lot of ways as a priest in a lot of ways, just like Melchizedek, the king priest of Zion. Now, this city is incredibly significant. It carries incredible prophetic significance. Highlighted for us in um, a phenomenal psalm, Psalm 132, which is a psalm of David. Uh, well, it's a, it's a um, Davidic psalm, and it is a Zion psalm as well. Uh, read with me verse 13. For the Lord, Yahweh, has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place, saying, This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will bless this city, and I will install my king, the horn of Israel. Um, the, his crown will be installed here in Zion, the Messiah. However, this psalm does not begin with the Messiah. Rather, it begins with David saying, Remember, O Lord, in David's favor, all the hardships he endured, how he swore to Yahweh. He vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, I will find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the Most High. I will build him a temple. Um, Yahweh swear, or David swears to Yahweh. Well, Yahweh. Um, responds to David's vow with a vow of his own. David vowed to Yahweh, and now Yahweh vows to David a sure oath. Now, the contents of this oath and this event are recorded in what might be the most important chapter, or one of the most important chapters in the whole Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 7. This chapter opens with Nathan, the prophet Nathan, affirming David's desire to build a temple, build a house for Yahweh. But then Nathan goes to sleep. He has a prophetic dream where God tells Nathan to communicate to David, no, you will not build me a house. Rather, I will build you a house, David, a dynasty, a monarchical dynasty that will go on generation after generation. But this is only the beginning of the promises of the Davidic covenant recorded in 2 Samuel 7. Let's open up to this all-important chapter, 2 Samuel 7. Um, <laughs> the Lord says to David, my servant, I took you from um, the pasture, from following the sheep. You were nothing, and I made you prince over 
my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you went, and I will make for you a great name. Now, who else did Yahweh make this promise to? This should sound to you like um, Yahweh's promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Now, as a matter of fact, there are many parallels between the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7 and the Abrahamic covenant introduced to us in Genesis 12, but then expanded throughout that book. So, Yahweh promises to David in 2 Samuel 16, your house and your kingdom will be made sure forever. Your throne will be established forever. And hints of this were given to Abraham when he said, kings will come to you, come from you, Abraham. Multiple kings, plural. And then read also verse 12 in 2 Samuel 7. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, David, you are going to die. But... I will raise up for you offspring, seed, think Genesis 3.15, seed who will come from your body. I will establish his kingdom and I will be to him, this seed, um, a father and he will be to me a son. But think about this. Think about all the future kings of um, Judah from the line of David who commit iniquity. When they commit iniquity, I'll discipline them with the stripes of men, but my steadfast love, I will never take that from them. I will be eternally loyal to the house of David, unlike um, Saul, whom I put away from before you. Now this, again, this, this steadfast love and loyalty and faithfulness to the house of David is reflected in another amazing um, psalm. Psalm 89, for I said the steadfast love will be built up forever in the heavens and you will establish your faithfulness specifically to David my servant. This whole psalm is a reflection on 2 Samuel 7. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant, I will establish your offspring forever, and I will build up your throne for all generations. But we know the history of Israel, don't we? how Babylon came in and burned Zion to the ground, and how he took Zedekiah from out of um, Jerusalem, plucked the eyes from out of his head, and after that point, there was no king um, from the line of David on the throne in Jerusalem. And the psalmist, Ethan the Ezraite, he is aware of this history too. So look at verse 38, how we transition from his offspring shall endure forever, his throne as long as the sun before me. Verse 38, but he says, you have cast off. Think about um, 586, Babylon coming in and destroying Jerusalem. You have cast off, you have rejected, you are full of wrath against your anointed, the, the Messiah, the anointed king. You have renounced your covenant with your servant. You have defiled his crown in the dust. Oh, Lord, where, where is your steadfast love of old um, by which, or the, the faithfulness that you swore to David? You see, David and his sons failed generation after generation after generation. But in the fullness of time, um, the same spirit which rushed on David at his anointing will overshadow a young girl named Mary and her son. He will listen. He will shema and he will obey the will of his father perfectly. But before that takes place, we must go through a long history of failure and rebellion, beginning with David's great, with Israel's greatest king, David, in 2 Samuel. 10 to 20. We are going to look at his fall next.